In the beginning there was peace, and in the end there will be peace. But what is here and now is war, not a war of money or land, but rather one of spirituality. The Bigala Crucifix is on a seven foot piece of wood. It's tempura painted on wood of the Christ figure on the cross of the crucifixion. And in the optimum of the Christ figure is this erect penis with testicles. And that's pretty good stuff for the 12th century. Because if the artist who remains anonymous had ever been caught, the church and art, fine art, has used this kind of symbolism, not necessarily an erect penis, but uh, throughout our history. It's a part of art. This figure of a mockery of Christ has utilized embedded imagery to subconsciously stimulate viewers for 700 years. Despite the great accomplishment of the Bigalo, it is no match for the incredible success of the famed San Damiano Crucifix. The San Damiano Crucifix is an extremely popular Christian symbol. It is essentially a, a cross that uh, St. Francis of Assisi uh, prayed to and which he said spoke to him. But there's some problems with this particular crucifix. And the big problem is it is very much like the Begalo crucifix because it also has the underside of testicles and erection painted right in the abdomen of what is supposed to be Christ. Once again, by an unknown Italian artist who wouldn't dare put his name on this particular painting because there would be repercussions should someone had consciously seen that particular uh, erection on the abdomen. This cross is a blasphemous cross. This cross is in the possession of millions of people, millions of people. And the Franciscans know of this story. When St. Francis died, the Clare nuns took it out of public view for 700 years, meaning they hid it for 700 years. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know whether to destroy it, to burn it or whatever, because it apparently gave some kind of power from it. And since that cross came out again in 1957, displayed during Holy Week, the Vatican decides this is the time to bring this cross out, convinces the Clares to do so. It has been copied throughout the world. The hands of the saints near the erection gesture toward it as an introduction, as if they're actually speaking about it while holding variation phallic symbols of their own. Conscious perception can lead you in one direction and the subconscious can lead you in the opposite direction. They can operate independently or in a similar way. Uh, it's a part of the brain about which you know nothing at the conscious level, but which has an enormous effect upon your acceptance of cultural values, on your ability to, on your emotional uh, involvements. There's no part of your brain we can point at and say this is the unconscious, but it's something the effects of which you can measure and you can observe and you can validate. The risk for the artist embedding images is that they can and will be found after conscious examination and with ease by the embed expert, rendering them as regular images into the conscious mind. In the center of the retina is a little a dense group of cells called the fovea. And this fovea moves in saccades. When you have the perception that you're seeing the whole scene, you're not. You're seeing point to point to point. Now, wherever this fovea hits, you're going to perceive what it's hitting in your in the eye, the object. It's reflecting uh, at a conscious level. So if you were to put something in that ad aim as the unconscious, you would plant it off fovea. Now, the early studies of this were done with uh, billboard advertising. It's astonishing. I mean, these billboards, they, they work this thing out very scientifically. They're quite ex it's quite an expensive media. And then they came up with a machine called a pupilometer, which did the whole thing electronically and uh, made it very simple for any even relatively small advertising agency to test its ads with this. But it tracks what the, actual, the eye is actually striking. Uh, and perceiving at a cognitive or at the unconscious level. The brain is taking in all the information. I think in perception you have to assume it's instantaneous, operating, as they say, at the speed of light. And it takes in everything. It's total. Everything goes into your brain. Artists use subconscious st stimulation because um, they don't necessarily have to tell you what they're doing. It's fantastic. They can get you to buy a product. They can get you to buy a religion, buy into something. And uh, by using a sexual stimuli in combination with horror, 
they can infer uh, the blasphemy, if it's Christianity, for example, the horror side, but make you feel good about it because there's sex involved at the same time. And to do it all subconsciously or unconsciously is the key because when you're looking at something, your eye is picking up every detail of it subconsciously, but you have to focus your fovea on the very pinpoint of the particular painting, picture, or walking down the street. And if you don't do that, you're not going to pick it up. You're not going to remember it consciously. Artists use this because it's extremely powerful. You get the message across without actually telling the person consciously. These things have profound effects upon the subconscious. And if you can introduce these into an art form, you embed that idea of the, of the art into the, into the brain very, very deeply, and it will persist indefinitely. Otherwise, art is simply a picture, a drawing, a, a sculpture. It has no meaning at all beyond uh, uh, it's just simply something you observe. Leonardo da Vinci, obviously extremely well-known, famous artist, but there are many things that we don't normally know as a general population about Leonardo da Vinci. One is that he was most likely homosexual. He did in fact have sex with an underage boy and went underneath the judge to essentially have this sort of dismissed. The Last Supper. The big deal over this painting is that John is shown as a woman. Or is it really John? Well actually John is known as the apostle that Jesus loved. Peter and the one that he loved. So it's Peter and somebody else, which is, is always known to be John. So da Vinci paints uh, John as a woman, and that really is the embed. One of the examples is St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist, a man, but here painted by da Vinci as an androgynous person. Half man, half woman, possibly almost all woman. If you look at this painting, you can see it's quite feminine. So uh, an excellent story with respect to the Da Vinci Code, but fiction in a sense that, okay, John's a woman, but it's so feminine that we're going to maybe make her something out to be Mary Magdalene. And then we're going to use a, uh, a terrific caper to find out that, that she's really the cup of Christ and she's the Holy Grail. Uh, an excellent story in the fact that it's interesting, certainly not true, but all started hundreds of years ago by Da Vinci adding the embed and making John essentially a woman. Another Renaissance artist who was clearly homosexual was uh, Sandro Botticelli. So you have here a famous painting from Sandro Botticelli, Adoration of the Magi. But a lot of things are going on here that are inappropriate. He instilled two homosexual scenes inside this painting. The first one is to the left. A lot of times you'll see a horse or an animal uh, to signify sex. This one has a horse peering in on the left side of this particular painting and two guys grasping each other. One right from behind, left hand and right hand. One on the forearm, one on the shoulder area. And they're both wearing really, really short skirts. As you can see, the foot of the guy behind the person in the front has his heel raised as if he's about to drive something behind this guy. You have to watch all of the places, all of the pieces of the body. Again, everything is planned, everything is sketched. The man in the front is holding a very long sword right through his crotch area, and part of it is sticking up. The person on the left of them is holding another phallic symbol and pointing his hand of, hey, what's going on here? Meaning, let's look over to our left. But these guys really don't care what's happening behind them. I mean, after all, this is the birth of Christ, and this is a special time. Three wise men are in town, who are the sons of the Medici family that actually commissioned the painting. But they don't care about that. They care about fooling around. If you look at the man who's grabbing the one in the front, his eye is clearly looking down at the man's crotch. He has no care whatsoever what's going on behind them. And then across the way, you have a, another man who is on his knees, bending over, bending forward. And he's turned around, looking up at a man behind him. And the man behind him 
has his hips rotated, his knee bent out, and his heels clicked toward each other, as if his torso is about to be engaged in a forward motion. This is hidden by some person, thing, jumping in between to stop what you see here. But that person actually has no face, hiding what's going on behind that particular scenario in front of Christ. The person who is kneeling is looking back and up at the person who's doing this rotation. As you move over to the right of this painting, you have, of course, the androgynous person. A person, not male, not female, is he or she pregnant? What is it? Is it a fat guy? Is it a pregnant woman? Actually, it's Botticelli looking directly at you. Doesn't care what's happening over here with Christ. And if you look in the stomach area, you see again the A for Antichrist. So suggestion that that could have been the Antichrist or it should have been the Antichrist. People make the mistake of accepting the imagery but it is carefully planned to fool the viewer who accepts the art by feeling it is harmless when it is not. Art is planned. We plan every single minute detail to whatever we're doing, whether we're painting, whether we're writing, whether we're making a movie, acting, singing. And it's no different in the embeds that artists will use in their particular works or sculptures or paintings or, or photographs. It's all planned. We don't throw paint around or throw words around or throw people around and just that's the way that it happened. That's not the case, especially with Renaissance artists and artists of a bygone era who first sketched out exactly what they were thinking about before they would get anyone near to paint those particular images. Uh, tremendous planning went into these paintings and it took years to actually finish them. So even if they were going in the wrong direction, they surely would fix it, but they didn't. They kept with the direction that was in the planning the entire time. We plan every single minute detail. Don't think that's not the case. Also, embedded images always turn out to be the same thing to everyone once the conscious mind identifies it. The ridiculous excuse of staring at something long enough and you'll see something is a false challenge by deceptive creators as embeds will only be seen if they're actually placed there. You can stare at a painted wall until the end of time and nothing will be seen because nothing was purposely embedded. In fact, these organizations would never spend so much money and time on the process if it weren't incredibly effective. When your brain tells you, you you know what you're doing and you've solved the problem, go back and take another look because your brain tricks you very, very often. And we are in the business of tricking brains in, in our merchandising, advertising, uh, and the selling of everything from religion to underarm deodorants. And we're very ill-equipped, and I assume on purpose, this stuff is not taught in universities because if it did, there'd be a hell of a clamor publicly for the uh, media people, and perhaps the religions to stop it. Dr. Stanley Monteith is the nationally syndicated talk show host of Radio Liberty, an accomplished author and lecturer on geopolitics, who has spent more than 30 years researching the causes for America's spiritual and moral decline. You'll find these things in stained glass windows. Uh, you look at it every day, it'll have no significance at all to you. Uh, on the other hand, when somebody points it out to you, it may have a sexual significance, or there may even be a demonic significance to it. Many times, for instance, a star will be there, but the star will have, rather than the point upward, it'll be downward, which, of course, is a satanic emblem. And when you begin to understand what these emblems are, uh, the frequency many times, whether it's uh, the number 666 are used, uh, we see this repeatedly in all sorts of media, and yet unless somebody points them out to us, we do not recognize them. St. Paul, in, in the book of Thessalonians, referred to the mystery of iniquity. There really is another dimension out there, which most people are totally unaware of, and it's really a, a, the realm in which the spirits are battled for the souls of men is being fought. Now, what people do not understand is that these truly demonic forces do influence so much of what's going on today. Most people believe we're involved in a political battle, or an ideological battle, or a cultural battle. And I don't believe that at all. I believe we're involved in a spiritual battle that's being fought on a political, ideological, and cultural basis. And until people recognize where this real battle is, it's a spiritual battlefield, we can't understand anything that's going on today. 
probably much in the same way that a modern artist, a, a, a capable, creative, uh, skilled artist, but comparably his relationship with uh, Madison Avenue corporations. Uh, you're working for the church if you expect to eat regularly, and certainly in the in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and the church hired artists. And they didn't hire them because they liked them particularly. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of evidence. They, they distrusted them intensely. Michelangelo had a whole uh, dozen priests follow him around at the instructions of the Pope to make sure he didn't put anything naughty up on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. In order for a widespread distribution of embedded occult and pornographic imagery to occur other than by use of the Internet, the Oregon Catholic Press, run by publisher John Lim, and distributed to approximately two of every three U.S. archdioceses would accomplish this by putting millions of copies of such imagery on the covers of their hymnals and missiles in the pews of American churches. Working with the OCP as well as on his own, Steve Spammer, a Marianist brother, has been supplying the world with numerous deformed artwork for many years. Steve Spammer has a nasty habit of uh, putting satanic symbols in his artwork, one of which is the 666, which in Revelation is the sign of the beast. In this particular painting, uh, this red fire and blood painting of Jesus on the cross has twin 666s on each side of the cross. Her spammer has in, in many paintings uh, pictured Jesus with uh, oblong arms, gigantic hands, and faces that are really blasphemous. I mean, in this particular face, he looks like he's drunk. His hands are up in the air like, oh, what do you want me to do? And on each side of him, there are a couple of scenes of people who are extremely close to each other, so close that, you know, their hips are well within the, the rear ends of each other during a what is an elliptical shape where Jesus has these bandages wrapped around him. The elliptical shape is also used as a symbol of the vaginal opening, this pieta taken from Michelangelo's sculpture. If you notice, you see Mary's legs are extremely wide, spread wide open, which is inappropriate. And in addition, most of all, it's Jesus with, once again, his abdomen having the underside of a penis, uh, such as the Bigalo crucifix and the San Damiano crucifix. They know there's 666. Uh, sometimes the sixes are backwards. Uh, this is well known throughout the art. You can make them upside down, inside out. But you see here an androgynous person. You don't know if this is a man or a woman in a wild outfit, looking to the sky in a very harsh gray uh, atmosphere, and three sixes sitting right in front of it. Don't expect to see a painter using font types that you find on your computer today. They're just not going to do it. They're trying to fool you consciously. So you're going to put their own handwriting. They're going to put sixes or other things together, or the word sex, in, in a way where you can't see it consciously. That's, this is not the New Times Roman font or Arial or Helvetica or something. This is their handwriting, and they're going to utilize that uh, to their advantage. Well, Steve Spammer, uh, again, loves to show Jesus as someone who's very tired or high or drunk or out of his mind, not quite thinking, and he does this with his drooping nose and jowls and eyes. And here you have uh, Jesus administering to a man. You don't see the man's face, but obviously he's right in the crotch region of Christ. In addition to that, Jesus has a tail. Stever Spammer's uh, recollection of Jesus and Pontius Pilate. You see Pontius Pilate sitting on some kind of a judge's chair, and he has puckered lips and Jesus is very submissive, but if you look, you'll see that hanging down from the chair of Pontius Pilate is a flaccid phallic symbol, inviting Jesus to perhaps perform something to get off on this particular crime that he committed. Stever Spammer has painted the dove coming in from the heavens, but he didn't quite make it. This uh, dead dove with the closed eye has been overcome by the three six-pointed stars and the fire of hell and Satan. The fruit of the vine would, of course, encompass 666 as well. 
As you can see, there are three of them embedded, uh, some upside down, some inside out, but right in the picture of this particular tree. The Oregon Catholic Press uh, brought out the Today's Missile, done again by Steve Erspammer, and this one's for Lent. And as you can see, Erspammer just cannot get away from 666. He just puts in another three sixes wrapped around in between this Christ figure and stained glass. And at the end of these sixes would be what resembles a snake face, snake head, with a tongue inside each one of them. On top of that, you have what's supposed to be Christ, or is this an old man from the Bowery? He has a Bowery hat on, he has a band around the hat, he has discolored hands, one's one color, one's the other, one's a foot, it's a different color. And he could be taken. I mean, we can get him, we can get Jesus, he's an old man, it's all over. We can get him. That's the message that's being shown. Jesus is a bum, and 666 is preventing him from getting to the church, to the stained glass, behind him. St. Francis of Assisi, who never can be seen to be left alone, he's often pictured with birds on him. But there's one problem. When you have the most unclean bird, symbol of um, Satan, symbol of the occult, and a problem not in Christianity, not seen in Christianity, which is the owl, an extremely unclean bird. Of course, this is the showcase bird for St. Francis of Assisi in this picture. He has it in his left hand, sinister hand, as if he's saying, poof, here's the owl. And the owl's looking right at you, like, uh, what are you going to do about it? Shortly after the initial OCP discoveries, Kalache logged into EWTN, the global Catholic network founded by Mother Angelica, who often used the phrase, Luciferian influence in the Catholic Church. She has been recently silenced by a mysteriously lingering illness and subsequent medication.